Good morning, uh, everybody, and, and thanks for joining us at our uh, second virtual press conference. Today I'm joined by FBI Director Chris Ray, and we're here to discuss significant developments in the FBI's investigation of the December 6 shooting at the Pensacola Naval Air Station that killed three U.S. sailors and wounded eight other Americans. Four months ago, I announced that this shooting was an act of terrorism. I also publicly asked Apple to help us access the locked contents of the two iPhones belonging to the terrorist who was killed at the time of his attack, Mohammed Saeed al Shamrani. It was clear at the time that the phones were likely to contain very important information. Indeed, Al Shamrani attempted to destroy both of the phones, even going so far as to disengage from the gunfight long enough to fire a bullet into one of the phones. Within one day of the shootings, the FBI sought and obtained court orders supported by probable cause authorizing the Bureau to search the contents of both phones as part of its investigation. The problem was that the phones were locked and the FBI did not have the passwords, so they needed help to get in. And we asked Apple for assistance and the President asked Apple for assistance. Unfortunately, Apple would not help us unlock the phones. Apple had deliberately designed them so that only the user, in this case the terrorist, could gain access to their contents. Today I am pleased to announce that thanks to the relentless efforts and ingenuity of FBI technicians, the FBI finally succeeded in unlocking Al Shamrani's phones. The phones contained information previously unknown to us that definitively establishes Al Shamrani's significant ties to Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, not only before the attack, but before he even arrived in the United States. We now have a clearer understanding of Al Shamrani's associations and activities in the years, months, and days leading up to his attack. Indeed, the information from the phones has already proved invaluable in protecting the American people. A counterterrorism operation targeting AQAP operative Abdullah al Maliki one of Al Shamrani's overseas associates was recently conducted in Yemen. We will not hesitate to act against those who harm Americans. I would now like to, tur uh, to, to uh, turn the podium over to Director Ray, who will provide further information and an update on the FBI's investigation. Thank you. Uh, first, let me say I deeply appreciate the Attorney General's leadership and support for the FBI, both in our relentless fight against terrorism and in our drive to obtain the vital evidence we need to protect the American people. We're here today because of a tragic reminder of just how grave, how imminent the terrorism threat still is. An Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula associates murder of three people and wounding of eight others right here in America. As the Attorney General described, through a combination of skill and determination, the men and women of the FBI have succeeded in accessing the terrorist two phones, both of which he tried to destroy. Our investigation into December's terror attack in Pensacola continues. So there are limits on what I can say today, but this is an important moment in an important case. It's important because what accessing the evidence of this killer's phone allows us to do to protect the American people. In just a short time, we finally access that evidence. We and our partners have already put it to good use. Among other steps we've taken, just a moment ago, you heard the Attorney General describe the recent counterterrorism operation targeting Abdullah al Maliki, one of the overseas AQAP operatives that al Shamrani associated with while here in the United States. 
It's also important because it underlines just how serious our fight against terrorism is and how vital it is for the FBI to maintain its unflagging vigilance against the threat. The evidence we've been able to develop from the killer's devices shows that the Pensacola attack was actually the brutal culmination of years of planning and preparation by a longtime AQAP associate. The new evidence shows that al-Shamrani had radicalized not after training here in the United States, but at least as far back as 2015, and that he had been connecting and associating with a number of dangerous AQAP operatives ever since. It shows that al-Shamrani described a desire to learn about flying years ago, around the same time he talked about attending the Saudi Air Force Academy in order to carry out what he called a special operation. And he then pressed his plans forward, joining the Air Force and bringing his plot here to America. Thanks to a lot of hard work by our people, we now know that al Shamrani continued to associate with AQAP, even while living in Texas and in Florida. And then in the months before the attack, while he was here among us, he talked with AQAP about his plans and tactics, taking advantage of the information he acquired here to assess how many people he could try to kill. He was meticulous in his planning. He made pocket cam videos as he cased his classroom building. He wrote a final will purporting to explain himself and saved it in his phone. The exact same will that AQAP released two months later when they initially claimed responsibility. He wasn't just coordinating with them about planning and tactics, he was helping the organization make the most it could out of his murders. And he continued to confer with his AQAP associates right up until the end, the very night before he started shooting. Now we're still exploiting the evidence we've now obtained from Al Sharmani's phones and we're continuing to run our investigation now with the benefit of a lot more insight into the murderer's mind and intentions, his relations with AQAP and his tactics. We have more to learn, but we know enough now to see Al Shamrani for what he was, a determined AQAP terrorist who spent years preparing to attack us. We now have a picture of him we didn't have before we obtained this evidence, before we could confirm that his connection to AQAP was real before we could track his long and methodical path to violence, a picture we would never have obtained without accessing his devices. This case is a potent reminder for anyone who needed one of the stakes of our work. We protect the American people from a staggering range of threats, but make no mistake, securing the homeland against terrorism remains our top priority. The men and women of the FBI are deployed around the clock, all over the country and around the world, identifying and disrupting threats and pursuing those who would do us harm. At the FBI, we remain laser focused on the terrorism threat, not just because of how much damage an attack can cause our country, but because we also know that even as we speak, there are evolving and sophisticated groups around the world intent on striking us. Whether core Al-Qaeda or its offshoots like AQAP or ISIS or the many others, we are working with our partners to find and disrupt them wherever they are, whether they're plotting attacks on Americans here at home or abroad. Our people are attacking every aspect of the terrorism threat, international, like we're here talking about today, and domestic with dedication and expertise, with innovation to more than match the evolving threat and with a commitment to getting the job done right. On the topic of innovation, I want to thank and congratulate the men and women of the FBI who devoted months of hard work to accessing these devices. They successfully tackled a problem that required tenacity, creativity, and technical expertise. 
Those qualities are valuable in any organization, so I know how fortunate we are and how fortunate the American people are that we have so many people with those qualities at the FBI. That's why we work to recruit the kinds of people we do. The magnitude of the challenge they faced is hard to overstate. We received effectively no help from Apple. We canvassed every partner out there and every company that might have had a solution to access these phones. None did, despite what some claimed in the media. So we did it ourselves. Unfortunately, the technique that we developed is not a fix for our broader Apple problem. It's a pretty limited application. But it has made a huge difference in this investigation. While we're thanking the FBI's computer scientists, engineers, and other professionals for their hard work, we should also be thinking about the cost of all that work. Public servants, already swamped with important things to do to protect the American people, toiling through a pandemic and with all the risk and hardship that entails, had to spend all that time just to access evidence that we had court-authorized search warrants for months ago. Our engineers and computer scientists working to access these phones were also needed on other pressing national security and criminal investigations. But the delay from getting into these devices didn't just divert our personnel from other important work. It also seriously hampered this investigation. Finally getting our hands on the evidence al-Shamrani tried to keep from us is great. But we really needed it months ago back in December when the court issued its warrants. In the aftermath of the attack, we and our Joint Terrorism Task Force partners worked urgently to collect and analyze evidence. In the weeks immediately following December 6, we conducted over 500 interviews of witnesses, base personnel, and the shooter's friends, classmates, and associates, among lots of other efforts. But because the crucial evidence on the killer's phones was kept from us, we did all that investigating, not knowing what we do know now. Valuable intelligence about what to ask, what to look for. If we had, our round-the-clock, all-hands-on-deck effort would have been a lot more productive. And now, months after the attack, anyone he spoke to here or abroad has had months to concoct and compare stories with co-conspirators, destroy evidence, and disappear. As a result, there's a lot we can't do at this point that we could have done months ago. You'll hear more from the Attorney General in just a moment on just how vital lawful access is to every part of both our law enforcement and national security missions. Cybercrime, opioid trafficking, child sex exploitation, you name it, lack of lawful access affects every fight we're in. And Americans need to understand that this isn't just an issue for law enforcement. Lack of lawful access certainly affects our ability to do our jobs, but we know where the harm really falls when evidence is kept unavailable. It falls on innocent people, the people we're sworn to protect. In this case, we and our partners aren't the only ones who needed that information months ago. The victims, those who were wounded and those who lost loved ones, deserved to know then what happened, not to have to wait to hear it from AQAP months after the fact when one of the killer's own associates, the operative Abdullah al-Maliki that the Attorney General and I both mentioned earlier, issued AQAP's claim of responsibility for the attack. We at the FBI never forget that three brave members of our armed forces were killed in this attack. They were Airman Mohammed Samah Haitham from St. Petersburg, Florida, Ensign Joshua Caleb Watson of Coffey, Alabama, and Airman Cameron Scott Walters from Richmond Hill, Georgia. They were serving our country and they died as heroes. And we have them front of mind every day as we continue the battle against the same threat they did. 
I want to end by also extending my and the FBI's thanks to all of our partners. Our partners are essential to everything we do, and this case in many ways has been a perfect example of that. Our Joint Terrorism Task Force in Jacksonville and our Pensacola resident agency have led this investigation in partnership with their colleagues in the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Northern District of Florida, and with essential help from NCIS, Air Force OSI, ATF, Homeland Security Investigations, and the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. The assistance of our state and local partners in Pensacola has been invaluable as well, as has been that of our intelligence community partners. And I especially want to recognize the brave Naval Security Forces personnel and deputies from the Escambia County Sheriff's Office who responded to that initial call for help. The Defense Department has also been an essential partner. In addition to DOD's work on the JTTF, the Navy officials in Pensacola and DOD personnel at all levels, both in Washington and around the world, have been vital to our effort to investigate this heinous attack and prevent others in the future. Finally, to the victims and their families, know that our work continues. Right now, we and our partners are exploiting the evidence from this investigation, pursuing the killer's potential associates and the new evidence that these devices can now lead us to. We and our JTTF colleagues come in every day dedicated to preventing terrorism from any place by any actor. And that work will never rest. Thank you.